Christmas Eve 1986, I was 17 in a maternity ward filled with sleeping mothers whose babies were all in the nursery section also sleeping. The only light in the room was the night light above my bed and I gazed down at a totally defenceless, innocent, jaundiced, stained-faced eyes of my baby son. I was overwhelmed with love. He was tiny, tiny and restless and when I looked into his eyes it looked as if there was already a million things going on in his mind. As the bells of the town church rang out for midnight mass, my love and commitment to my baby made me cry and promise to always be there for him, to stand up for him, protect him and love him no matter what. I had no way of knowing that every day for the next 32 years, this promise and love would be put to the test. Michael almost never slept. The toddler he became was non-stop. And the first through to the last years of school were a nightmare for him, me and the schools. At seven, his reading level was that of a 13 year old. He became, if he became interested in something, it became an obsession and a compulsion. He was clumsy and his coordination was not the best. He still didn't sleep very much and he didn't understand social interactions like other children his age. I continually sought help from and worked with schools, mental health, police and disability services. His case was even put forward to the Legislative Assembly in Canberra. His last days in high school were spent in the Special Education Unit. And after finally being diagnosed at the age of 14 with Asperger's by Tony Atwood, Michael was clever, had a very high IQ, was charismatic, well-spoken and very well-mannered. Due to his medical conditions, Michael had become addicted to pre prescribed main pain medications, which led to him medication seeking at doctors, hospitals and through ambulances. His interest and abilities in understanding financial and computer areas led him to being convicted of fraud. He understood these things, but he didn't know how to actually use them. He did serve prison time. He told me he felt safe there. He had guidelines and a routine and it made him feel secure. I cried and I asked him where I'd gone wrong. What I could have done to make things better. He was hurting, confused and I couldn't help him. He told me, Mum, I can't change me, how could you? An addiction coupled with obsessive, compulsive personality and doctors, etc., or turning him away led to meth use. Michael loved his family and forgave easily. He did have good friends who always tried to help him. He had a wonderful sense of humour and he could easily make you laugh. He never judged people. Everyone was the same to him. His calls don't come anymore. I don't hear his jokes. His stories are gone. He always told me he loved me. I don't hear that anymore either. I can't call him. I can't see him or touch him. And worst of all, I can't find him. I couldn't keep my promise to protect Michael. Someone knows what happened to my son. Someone knows how to allow me to do the last thing I can do as a mother. Someone can give my son back to me so I can visit him and talk to him again even though I know he won't be answering. 
someone out there knows what happened to Michael, I now ask that whoever you are, please do the right thing. Step forward. Provide the answers so we, so we can bring a much-loved son home with dignity. Please do this for Michael. Please do this for me, for his family, his friends, and for yourself. I know with certainty he would do it for you. Until February this year, all Michael and I had was hope. For hope was each other. Now all I have left is the hope that whoever you are, you choose to do the right thing. Michael was always a bit of a pain from when we were young all the way through. Uh, he liked to be the centre of attention, uh, no matter what way he got that, whether that be making an absolute fool out of himself or really anything. Uh, had a way of memorising things that no one else could, whether that be the cheat codes and video games that he'd played for 10 minutes several years beforehand. Uh, or right down to exactly how computers work in every single way. He was also great at explaining how it all worked. Um, and through that, I've started my own career in IT. He always wanted to make someone laugh in some way, trying to lighten the situation no matter what. Uh, when he did... Uh, ended up being found guilty of fraud and went to prison. He called me about a week afterwards, basically saying, oh, don't worry, I'll, I've deserved this, I've done the wrong thing. But plenty of people in here have done worse. And that he'd be out and back to annoying us with 2am drunken phone calls again. Unfortunately, we don't get to have those anymore no matter how annoying they were at the time. I wish that we could. Some of us can't be here today to, to plead with you to give us some form of information, such as our uh, sister that lives in Queensland and other family that lives overseas and all around Australia, and even his close friends and former partners that have always kept in touch and have been liaising with us at all times, showing their support. I just wish that I could have told him how much he meant to me, no matter what. And I hope to be able to say goodbye properly to him. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to thank the media for attending today and your help in finding some answers surrounding Michael's disappearance and your previous help uh, with Bill Thompson's uh, previous media release. It's now more than six months since Michael has gone missing and not an hour goes by without us thinking about what has become of him. There is probably nothing more devastating for us as parents than to lose our son or his, or his brother Andrew and sister Kelly to lose their big brother. It's made worse by not knowing where Michael is. His mother, Donna, has also had to endure the tyranny of distance whilst coming to grips with Michael being missing. The Michael we know is a keen son who always wanted to please and a brother that his siblings looked up to. He was an IT master and had developed his computing skills since he was 10 years old. He was always able to find flaws in a system and provide a way to fix it. In fact, he moved here to Adelaide to expand his IT career. 
We believe that there are people out there who can help us, help us put our mind at rest and help us by giving information to Crime Stoppers that can help locate Michael and information about the events leading up to his disappearance. This information can be anonymous if, if you need to, of course. It would be the right thing to do if you can help us by, by giving information. We know that the last couple of years were a rocky road for Michael. He had his fair share of issues and troubles, but that doesn't belay the fact that we as a family need some answers and your help to bring Michael back to his family. Finally, I'd like to thank South Australian Police for their progress so far with our son's disappearance and Michael's close friends for the support they have provided during this difficult time. Any questions? When was the last time you spoke to Michael? I spoke to Michael late last year. Uh, Michael had a, led a fairly informal lifestyle. Um, at some stage, we'd always hear, uh, I, wouldn't, I might not necessarily hear from him, or, or Andrew might not necessarily hear from him for months, but he'd spoken to one of us and such. So, um, And it was just about family things and such when, 